session. We're going to have a short space of Q&A if you've got any questions. And it'll be nothing like the show Q&A. <laughs> All right. Let's give Mal a, a big welcome as he comes back again. Thanks, mate. <laughs> nothing like the show. Nothing. nothing like the show. Thank you very much, Gary. Have you had a good break? Some caffeine. I can't drink caffeine anymore because it actually constricts the throat. Three things, caffeine, tomatoes and lemon are counterproductive for speakers. Lemon juice, if it's done right, can be okay in something. But speakers who drink and lemon juice straight with honey, it's not a good move. So, I know you wouldn't drink coffee without caffeine, but I'm used to it now. In the second session today, which is a little bit shorter, I want to talk to you, because we're addressing the future, we need to address the generations that will carry the future on their shoulders. So in this session, we're talking about innovation, millennials and generation edge, building cultural architecture for emerging generations. Uh, a couple of years ago, in the United States, a young woman managed to petition Seventeen magazine with 100,000 signatories online to remove all photographs from their publications that were in any way photoshopped. She did it using support from her generation. Around the same time, a group of young men in America put together an app that allowed black young men to report what they see as political or, or police brutality in the death of a particular young man in that state. A little closer to where I live, a young woman two years ago came up with the No Makeup Selfie campaign. You might have seen it. Women, especially celebrities, putting photos of themselves online without makeup to raise money for cancer research. In one week, one week, she raised eight million British pounds for cancer research. This is what we call Generation Edge, and we're going to look at them in just a moment. They're a low trust but big noise generation. As a social futurist, there are several things that are axiomatic about the future. One is that the future is by definition unpredictable. Nobody, no matter who they are, no matter how many books they've written or how many qualifications they have, can definitively predict the future. There's only one who knows the future and it's not me. The future also is not a product of the technologies we use. Technology is not destiny. We're a product of how we choose to use technologies. And one of the biggest shapers of choice which impacts the future is generational aspiration. We're not even conscious of it usually, but our generational aspiration, generational heritage has a large impact in many studies on how we choose to live life, including how we choose to use technology. Now there are, in every generation, a series of shared experiences. You see, every generation has a story like an individual does, from infancy to adolescence to middle age to eldership. And by sharing certain experiences during a particular epoch in history, we develop certain generational traits or characteristics and attitudes. Again, we're not usually conscious of them. But if we were to, gen to gen uh, generically describe baby boomers aged between mid-50s and 70 today in Australia, we would say that we are historically a very idealistic generation hence the demonstrations of the late 60s, early 70s. We are something of an inner focused generation and that's where the, you know, the great boom in New Age mysticism came from in the early 70s and the experimentation with psychedelic drugs for some baby boomers in their youth. Following us was Generation X, much more pragmatic, much more, you know, if, you, if you're a boomer and you have a Gen Xer on your, on your company board, if you're the CEO and you've got a Gen X uh, managing director, for example, you will get frustrated with each other. You probably are now. <laughs> because the visionary boomer is always talking about the vision, the dream, where we want to go, what we want to do. And uh, the Gen Xer is quietly, sometimes loudly, thinking to him or herself, well, thanks very much for sharing the 60s yet again. Can we just talk about how we're going to make this happen? I know you have a dream, Martin Luther King Jr., but how is it going to happen? Gen X is age between mid-30s and early 50s today. The millennials, my three young adult children, my eldest daughter is right at the tip, top tip of millennials. They're aged between about 21 and mid-30s. We'll come to them in a moment. And the final generation we have extant at the moment is Generation Edge. Some people call them Generation Z. That's a waste because after Z you've got to go back to A and who would want to be called something as uncool as Generation A? 
I call them Generation Edge because they are on the edge of some of the biggest changes and challenges and opportunities that humankind has faced in terms of technology, ethics and other things. Every one of those generations brings something different to innovation. The digital revolution we mentioned before is important to the millennials. In 1987, 86, the globe's technological capacity to store information was at the level of two and a half billion gigabytes globally. By 2007, 21 years later, that had ballooned from 2.5 to 295 billion gigabytes. Today, now, we add 2.5 quintillion, 2.5 times 10 to the power 18 bytes, keystrokes of information every day to the global database we call the internet, and it's growing exponentially every year. That's an awful lot of data. Of course, the fact that we have a lot of data doesn't necessarily mean we have a lot of wisdom. <laughs> we have data overload, but I'm not sure about the wisdom quotient. But it is a lot of information. It has shaped the millennial generation perhaps more than anything else. Millennials are, generically speaking, and please don't write me a letter if you know someone different to this, we're speaking generically whenever we speak of generations. <laughs> They're very optimistic. In a number of studies, particularly one just five years ago in the EU, young people were asked, who are the two groups of people that will have the biggest impact on the future? Their top two answers were scientists and young people. These guys really do believe, in a way that Generation X at their age didn't, that they can, given the right opportunities and resources, working with their generation in collaboration, because they're very collaborative, build a better type of narrative. They're a talented generation, they're the world's first globalised digital natives, first generation to be completely raised. There's no wow factor with digital for millennials. I mean, there's millennials here, there's no wow factor. When I got my first tablet, I've had about five, I'm an early adopter. I got my first tablet, I thought, isn't that a miracle? How amazing can they get all that stuff in that piece of glass? It's just a piece of glass. My kids, do, you know, oh yeah, sure, and they know how to work it within 30 seconds. There's no wow factor with millennials. They're a resourceful generation. In 2016, 200 billion dollars in the US alone in the purchasing power of one generation. That's a lot of money. By 2020 or 2022, they will have more spending power in the US than any other generation, including the so-called rich boomers. It's a very large generation, 25% of the US population in 2016. By 2025, three out of five workers globally will be millennials, so get ready. It's an innovative generation. In America, we expect 60, 70% of young people to say one of my aspirations is to have my own business. You wouldn't expect that in Europe. But last year, 46% of millennials said, I'd like to start my own business in Europe. They're a very innovative generation. It's a collaborative generation, as I mentioned. It is driving, in many ways, open innovation today, or the next wave of open innovation. It is the generation that is exploring most now in cities like Berlin and Soho and Cambridge, things like virtual reality and artificial reality. Virtual reality, of course, puts us into a totally imaginary environment using haptic technology. Haptic means it fools our senses. And we've gotten quite good at fooling the sense of sight and sound, but now technologists, young millennial technologists, are working on the sense of smell and taste so that you can, using a digital device of some description, have a taste test for a restaurant's menu before you go to the restaurant. Holography, you think it's sci-fi? Well, in the recent presidential election, the pre-election for the presidential candidates in France, one candidate was able to speak to seven venues at one time using holography, and it wasn't considered to be outlandish or ridiculous. The millennials are the ones driving the sharing economy. In cities like London today, you can share, own anything from a car to an electric car to a bicycle, a Boris bike, we call them, I don't know what you call them, to uh, an electric bike, a motor scooter, or an apartment, even a room within an apartment, you can share ownership. Education is shared ownership with the MOOC, the Massive Open Online Course. Anybody heard of that? Schools like Stanford, Harvard, MIT working together, realising for the first time that online or blended education is actually an adjunct to traditional education, not a replacement. So they're offering free courses completely to anybody who has access to the internet. Now in London we have the world's first MOMC, Massive Open Mobile course. 
students can now take a complete stream within a degree through an app on their phone, and at the end of that stream, they're awarded a nano degree. I think that sounds pretty sexy. I'd like one of those. Because it's a collaborative digital generation, we need to have an app culture if we are going to engage. I'm trying to make this very practical now, coming from the global overview of the first part of the last session down to the micro of innovation cultures within our individual enterprises. Technology is the new rock and roll, have you noticed? Now, I know retro people still buy record albums. I actually made a record album in 1984 and uh, printed by EMI in Sydney and I still have copies of it. So not only am I old, I'm retro cool. I not only buy records, I made one. I think that's cool. But people don't line up to buy records anymore. They don't line up down the street like we used to do sometimes for the latest release because they can download it in a few seconds on iTunes. But they will line up for an iPhone 6, 7, 8 or 9. Why? Because technology has replaced rock and roll music as the hub around which social change occurs. People used to buy albums, take them home, and if there was a social consciousness message, we boomers would talk to our friends about it, and we might start to do something about it if we got really passionate. Today, people do that with technology. The Arab Spring was driven by Twitter and Facebook. The campaign to have women drive in, Audi in the uh, Saudi states was driven by people using Instagram and Facebook. The London riots a few years ago was driven by social media contact come together for this flat flash mob moment. We need to digitize our environment. It's a nurtured generation. This is interesting. You talk to CEOs who are usually of my age or a bit younger, a bit older, you'll find, as a number of studies have done, they don't have a particularly rosy picture of millennials. Some of them think that millennials are spoiled, emotionally brittle, needing constant reinforcement. They're there, it's okay, you'll be all right. <laughs> Self-occupied, only interested in themselves and their friends, not interested in a multi-generational enterprise. CEOs think they disregard authority while expecting much from authority. Many feel that they are unwilling to commit, that you spend a lot of time training them and educating them on the job, and then within two to three years on average, they leave and go somewhere else. Now, I'm not, true, I'm not sure that all of that is true. Some of it may be, but that's the perception. One thing I do know for sure about millennials is that they place a premium on trust. Because they are nurtured, they are certainly better nurtured than Gen X was before them. I wrote a book in 1991 in Melbourne called Youth, the Endangered Species, and the title said it all. We had at that time among the top three suicide rates in the world, not the developed world, the world among teenagers. The latchkey generation, we called them. Kids who'd come home, had no one to talk to for hours. I mean, mind you, it's the same now, except kids have someone in the room, they're just not talking to them. <laughs> and the ones who start that, by the way, are the parents. They place a premium on trust, and so they are the ones driving the global debates about ethics. Go to universities in other parts of the world, as I'm doing in, in the next month, and you will talk to students who are driving the ethics debates. They're asking questions about means versus ends. As we play with the gadgets, do we even have time to think about the end that we're producing, the end result? Or are we, in the words of one French philosopher, building faster machines to take us absolutely nowhere? They're thinking about the law of unintended consequences. Are we giving enough thought in the present to the future implications of our technologies? They're thinking about the line between human and machine. In an age we are, where we are increasingly going to be inviting technology not just into our homes but into our bodies through chips and enhancements and so on, prosthetics, will we lose the line between humanity and technology? Is that line even important anymore? I tend to think it probably is. But these are the questions they're asking. They're at the forefront of the core call for a new ethic in economics, in business. The University of Birmingham 10 years ago set up Europe's first school or faculty of global ethics. And now there are many other universities following suit. There are not many in Australia. We need to see them. And they will be driven by market forces to set them up because this ethics drive is very important. Ethics only asks two questions. It asks the question, what's the right thing to do? And secondly, how do I apply it in this non-binary 
choice. Non-binary meaning complex. There's no easy right and wrong. And the world we're coming into today is a world that has to deal with things ethically before it can really, in a sense, deal with them morally. We have to be able to make non, uh, uh, right choices in non-binary situations. And I love this generation in that they have made pop culture heroes of people like Michael Sandel, pictured in the middle there, a professional ethicist at Harvard University. If you have not read Justice, What's the Right Thing to Do by Michael Sandel, as a leader, you owe it to yourself and those you lead to read it. Justice, What's the Right Thing to Do, very popular book by Michael Sandel. Deborah Satz, Harvard, uh, Stanford University, also a professional academic, has written great books on what money can't buy. She's a professional ethicist. These kids, well, they call, I call them kids, they're not kids, they're young adults. These guys have made people like this, not rock stars, not pop stars, academics, into cult heroes on YouTube. Why? Because they're driven by the premium on trust. They feel that if people are given the right tools, they should be trusted to get on with a job. They should be taught how to make decisions for themselves and then allowed to do it. This means that we need to have trust cultures within our enterprises if we're going to engage these highly innovative millennials. Last year, the OECD issued a study globally in which it identified five areas where public trust is being degraded in public institutions. One area was tax. The big question for millennials is who's paying, who doesn't, who should pay. In Britain, there's a big debate, I'm involved in it in the BBC sometimes, about whether Google should be paying more tax. There's a big debate about migration. How many people should we take in? What should it cost? A big debate about business. There's a loss of trust in, in the role of business, particularly in shaping government policy. According to the OECD, the problem is that we're not sure who is shaping political policy. Is it politicians on our behalf or is it lobby groups on behalf of big business? Climate. Who should make the sacrifices to get a better deal for the climate? Science, who should we trust? We've got one study from here and one study from here and they're both on the same thing and saying completely different, coming to different conclusions. I believe that trust equals capacity to act. The more trust people have in you, the more right you have to act in a way that involves them. True? And whoever inspires the most trust in your organisation is the one that's shaping the culture. You can have the title but not be the cultural architect. The one who inspires the most trust is always the one that will be shaping the culture of your business or your enterprise. And I think when it comes to beyond our enterprise, by the way, the most urgent question if you're in business you can answer is not how profitable do we want to be in five years, but what kind of city do I want to live in in five years? And how can I, with what I've got, set that in motion? And millennials are very attracted to that sort of thinking because they're globalised. Trust beyond your enterprise is a product of three things. Your experience, what you know, your education, your years in business. Millennials respect experience. They may not seem to, but they do, because they know they're educated but not street smart. Millennials don't come out of university knowing about negotiation skills, for example. So they look to mentors who are older than them to teach them the street smart stuff. So there are ways you can gain respect, even if you're not as well educated as perhaps the, the millennial worker under you is. Your expertise, your integrity shapes the trust you inspire inside and outside your enterprise. But all of that is multiplied by a commitment to the common good. You will see an even bigger boost to the trust you inspire by having this attitude that says, I'm not just here in business for people who buy my products. I'm not just here for my clients. I'm here to improve people's lives in some way. If you buy my products, that's what I want. That's, I love that. P fantastic. We're making a profit. That's important. But I'm not just here for you. And when millennials smell that, they're automatically drawn to a business leader. It's a narrative generation moving quickly. In a McKinsey Quarterly study back in 2013, the question was asked of CEOs in America and Europe, what's the most difficult thing for you to provide for your team but the thing they want the most? And the number one answer, registered by over 90%, was the missing ingredient is meaning in the work. Meaning. In an age of disjointed data, ladies and gentlemen, people need a purposeful narrative that joins the data points and makes sense of them. So millennials don't just want to know what the company does, they want to know what it stands for. That's why we see the big companies now coming out with like mission statements in a sentence. They're trying to tell a story 
because it's a narrative generation. Millennials want context for all the content they've been given. Almost every form of information that's meaningful to a millennial comes with a story attached. Think about it. A song is usually a story. A video clip of a song is usually a story. Social media is storytelling, stream of consciousness fashion. Here's my life being logged one photo, one tweet at a time. I'm sharing myself, my brand, me with you. Stream of consciousness. I'm telling a story. It's a narrative generation. So if we're going to attract and engage this innovative generation, we need to be making sure that we're telling the story. Do you know when millennials come to you for a job, they're not thinking to themselves, how much will you pay me? Of course that's there, but it's not the primary thing. They're not even thinking, what vacation time do I get? A number of studies now across the world have indicated the number one thing that millennials are thinking about when they come, they may not say this, when they come for a job is, how can you help me improve the story I tell about me? How can you extend my contact list? How can you extend my range of experiences? How can you extend my expertise, my skills? For millennials, the greatest asset is not their mortgage, because as you'll see in a moment, that's not even on their horizon much of the time. Their greatest asset is their skill set. If you are committed to their skill set and developing it, you will produce great loyalty among millennials. We need to make sure for millennials we have the power of inclusion. When Churchill gave that famous speech, we shall fight on the beaches, we shall fight in the landing fields, we shall fight in the landing strips, we shall never surrender. June 4, 1940, in the House of Commons, it's only four lines in a speech that went for 20 minutes. We only remember the four lines. Why? Because the we shall is mentioned 10 times. That's the power of inclusion. And when I say the power of inclusion for millennials, I mean drawing sight lines to their work. Here's our big picture vision and strategy, but here's how you at your workstation, with your phone, in your role, are helping us meet this big picture story. This is how you are writing this story. Are you with me? So we need to make sure to a narrative culture, we also build big picture innovation cultures. How many have heard of Rock Corps? Anybody? Oh, it's a wonderful story. Rock Corps started in the early 2000s in America as a way of getting young people to come to big concerts with big artists, but the rule was you can't come to our concert unless you have a ticket. You can't buy a ticket. You can't win a ticket. You have to earn a ticket. For every ticket to our gig, you must put in four hours of community service. Tens of thousands of young people in America alone have given tens of thousands of hours to charity. In London, just a couple of years ago, Royal Albert Hall, 5,000 people filled the Royal Albert Hall for a concert all young, all millennials, they had given 20,000 hours of time to social projects working with 41 London charities. Think about that. 95% of millennials, 96% aspire to work in a green office too, an office that goes beyond the normal levels of compliance, that does that little bit extra. So if you want to attract and keep millennials, have a little more green, a little more paperless, a little more green, about the business space. Here's the big thing for millennials though, and it's important, there's a big expectation gap. Millennials have been trained from the time they're children by their parents largely, and also by their schools, to believe that they're a very special generation, and that uh, when they come out of school, everybody's gonna want to hire them, everybody's gonna want to pay them well, and they emerge into a situation that's nothing like they were promised. They face education costs that I didn't bear at their age. The average cost of a BA now in Australia is between fifteen and thirty-three thousand dollars. I didn't pay anything for my six years at university in Australia. Pension pain in New South Wales in 2017, the ratio of retirees to workers was four to one. Workers to retirees, rather, four to one. Within a few decades, it will be two to one. Twice as many people needing social care, social net, for the number of workers who provide it. And it's not going to be my generation who pay for that. And millennials know that. Housing. 66% of Aussies now live in a capital city. That's very high. But your rentals, on average, are now 15% higher than the UK. And that stuns me. 
because the UK is terrible for renting properties. Terrible. 15%, somebody should do something about that. And give the renters some rights, by the way. Demographia is a wonderful group of people who every year do a survey of the world and match in major cities the mean income against the mean mortgage cost. And they come up with a ratio, income to mortgage cost. According to their estimation, Australia now has 22 severely unaffordable cities compared to 11 in the US and 19 in the UK. Based on the ratio of mean income against mean mortgage cost. So Aussie millennials face a little more of this than people do in the US or the UK. And the reason this is important to millennials is not just about the money for them, it's about the narrative. You see, they want to take the blue skies thinking of the boomers and the grassroots mentality of Gen X and combine them together to tell a completely new type of narrative. And this robs them of that opportunity. That, ladies and gentlemen, is one of the reasons why they jump jobs so quickly. On average, 90-something uh, percent say within three years I'll be gone from my job. It's not that they're fickle. It's not necessarily they have short attention spans, though many do. Some, a lot of us have short attention spans now. It's because they feel the windows of opportunity are going to close fast and they want to get as much as they can while they can in terms of narrative, in terms of experience. We talked about automation before. It's an incredible thing what is happening in robotics. Roboticists now imagine a post-human phase coming next to which is not a phase without human beings. It's a phase where man and machine begin to merge so even now we can use virtual reality in sociable media, not social media, the next iteration is sociable media, where my avatar online, my three-dimensional representation of who I am in the virtual space can invite your avatar, Jason, to come for a cup of coffee with me, though we're on the other side of the world. And we will sit in a virtual environment and have a chat, and our commands are done with head movements, and we talk to each other. And because of haptic technology, including, by the way, the sense of touch, Technologists now are working to, and they're almost, they've almost cracked it, turning vibration when you touch something into digital code so that it can be transmitted from one device to another. And you're buying a sweater <laughs> online, sir, and you can feel on an area of your tablet, the next generation tablet, a part of what it feels like to buy that fabric. Haptic technology. This automation revolution and everything that goes with it is the biggest factor at the moment affecting the generation after the millennials and it will continue to do so for the next 15 years. It is the, it is the generation edge I mentioned earlier. They are very different to millennials in the same way that generation edge is ex uh, X is extremely different to boomers. Generation, and if you have kids, anyone here have kids or teenagers right now? And you're going to recognise at least one of these things in them. This is based on global studies and no generation, you, you can't see studies when a generation turns 12 because there's not enough data yet. So it's only with a little bit of distance that we can start to make prognostications about any generation. Generation Edge is very pragmatic, certainly in comparison with millennials. They're wary of promises about the good life without hard work. They take a long approach to, approach to building trust. For high school teachers, they'll tell you this, educators have often said this to me, you're right, Mel, it's taken me a lot longer to build trust with my class now than it did 10 years ago. They're wary and they want time and they take caution to develop trust. They're a self-reliant generation. They want to build their own narrative and they refuse to let anything stop them. So when MTV does a study and asks them their aspirations, 71% said, if I want to do something, nobody will stop me. Low trust, big noise, but not on the street, in the digital space. They're a reformist generation and they see the digital space as their place to bring reform. They don't see rebellion as some kind of cool thing you wear, like the Fonz, say, hey, look at me, I'm rebellious, you know, listen to my grunge music, that's what Generation X did, look at my grunge music, my punk, you know, I'm really rebellious. For these guys, that's not 
It doesn't mean anything. For them, re rebellion is a means to an end, and the end is reform. And the reform they want to bring is not on the street. You won't find these guys so much going out on the street and demonstrating. You won't find them setting up Occupy movements as much as millennials did. You will find them in the digital space. If you're serious as the leader of a company or an organization in engaging Generation Edge as they begin now to go to college and come out of college, you've got to prepare for it now. It's not waiting until they're there. And then you miss the talent pool because it's too late. You've got to start thinking about what are they saying now online? Where are they hanging out online and what are they saying there? And I'm just going to every so often consult that so that I keep in touch with their drive for, for, for reform in certain areas. That's why in high schools now, whistleblowers are often seen as the heroes of the story. You and I are asking questions about the line where uh, anarchy begins and activism ends. Uh, I've written several things and it's been out in the media about Julian Assange, not as an individual, but what he represents. I have concerns about that that an activist can either wittingly or unwittingly become an anarchist, where there is no solution being offered, but simply a statement of secrets. But for these kids in school, that's not the case. They see whistleblower often as the hero of the story because he or she is a reformer. Here's the interesting thing for me, and this has only just started to come out in recent years. It's a very conservative generation on many ethical issues. Over the last 15 years, the rates of alcohol and drug abuse among teenagers in the United Kingdom have gone down markedly. It's not because of anything the government has done, because people have looked at that. It's not because of any societal, general societal change in attitudes, because they've become more liberal, if anything. It's because this generation is, for some reason, naturally wired to be more conservative on ethical issues on some of the issues that we're debating in Australian politics right now, I won't go into them, but you would be surprised at how conservative the Gen Edges appear to be on these issues, on these social and ethical changes in society. That interests me. Generation Edge is going to need a lot of help because of automation with cognitive function. I don't mean psychiatric help. I mean, we're going to need to understand the pressure on cognitive function. It affects us. How many of you run a business again? Can I see your hand quickly? Yeah, you're right. You're in a board meeting. You've got 10 people around the table. Only six of them are really there. The other four are tweeting under the table. <laughs> Psychologists now call this absent presence. <laughs> One study in the UK last year suggested that 90% of people in companies who do this are actually talking to people in the room with them. <laughs> so it raises the question, why don't we just talk? <laughs> we have shallow think today. Studies in the US reveal that we are thinking broad and shallow, but not narrow and deep because of multi-screening. Multitasking sounds sexy but it's unproductive. Neuroscientists will tell you the brain can only really productively focus on one thing at a time. Shallow think. We know a little bit about a lot, but not a lot about a little. So I'm telling young people now when I speak to them, listen, you need to start specialising in something. Have a broad adjacent possible because that's where innovation comes from. But make sure you specialise in at least one thing. It'll set you apart from your peers. Transactional relationships. When I got married 37 years ago, my wife Davina and I formed a transactional relationship. She remembers some things better than I do. I remember some things better than she does. Together we sort of get it right now and again. We do that now with machines. You do not remember what you learn on the internet. Promise. You do not remember most of what you learn on the internet. You rely on Pocket or Evernote or some other sharing platform to store it for you. But because it doesn't get into your long-term memory, it has no opportunity to produce innovation because new ideas are always born out of connections between old ideas. It's not just a problem for Gen Edges, it's a problem for me. And what about social disinhibition? We're doing a lot on this in the BBC not long ago. People will do and say things online they would never do offline. Never. Because they think they have anonymity. So last year, two, 
percent of 2,000 Brits who were surveyed said, yes, hand up, I have insulted someone I didn't know online this year, at least one person. Now, it sounds like a small number, 2% of 2,000 Brits, but extrapolate that across the British population, that's 2 million people being insulted by 2 million people they didn't know and have never seen online. Social disinhibition. It's where fake news, as we now know it, comes from. That sense of anonymity that allows me to put stuff up it's fake hiding amongst the real, and it's hiding because we've got so much data we don't have time to sort through it. So what's happening now in London, journalists are voluntarily now coming together with software developers to put up warnings on sites that they believe to be suspect. So the public at least has some way, someone is telling them, it's not censorship, it's just a sense of you better be wary of this, you know, take it on advisement, buyer beware. We're going to see more of that in the next few years. It's moving on quickly. We need, with Generation Ed, to have autonomous cultures. If we're going to get the best of their innovation, we've got to build, in an age of uh, automation, we've got to build human autonomous cultures, humanising the digital. Just last week, John Dyson, anybody know who John Dyson is? Dyson Vacuum Cleaners, one of the largest success stories in British business, worth billions of pounds now. Started in the 1980s, wonderful story. He said last week, I only answer six emails a day. And I don't allow my staff to bring tablets and phones to our meetings. They have to use paper notebooks. Now, I've been saying that for 10 years. I was so encouraged to hear John Dyson, of all people, saying that. I, I'll promise you this. You bring a blackboard and chalk into a meeting that has any Gen Edger in it and you've got their attention straight away because they don't know what it is. I mean, I recognise the shape. It's a 16-9 rectangle. Obviously, something's coming, but what's that white stuff you've got in your hands? And why is it getting all over you? What's your problem with dandruff? I don't understand. <laughs> We've got to humanise the digital space. It could be as simple as saying in your office space, see that coffee machine over there? It's not a regulation, but a cultural expectation in this company that you don't use your phone or your tablet in that space. That space is for old-fashioned biometrics. Children under five in the UK right now are exhibiting ADD-like symptoms even though they're not diagnosed with ADD because they cannot read facial signals. Too many screens. It's a simple thing to do. Bank of America did a study just last year. 90%, 90 of its workers were given censored badges to wear around. At the end of the week, they assimilated the data and they found that the most productive workers in the Bank of America, the biggest in America, were those who mingled the most. So this led them to change all of their approach to coffee breaks. They no longer encourage people to have, people have their coffee and donut at the desk. They encourage them by building a much nicer coffee area to have people going into these new and exciting and variegated throughout the building coffee areas and within about six months, they had a 10% boost in their national productivity. I didn't say this. The Bank of America said this. It's a simple thing to humanise the digital. Just paper notebooks. Buy your team some tactile, not, not rubbish ones from Woolworths. Buy some, sorry, Woolworths. Buy some really nice tactile, art, artistic, good-looking notebooks and give them to people. Say, right, put your phone away. I don't want your phone. This is, this is for human time. This is eyeball time here. Right? Reflection cultures for Gen Edge is very important for us, even more important for them. Imagination breaks boost performance. Google knew that when it set up its 20% time rule. Anybody heard of that? Yeah, of course you have. For every four hours you work on a Google project, you were, at the beginning of Google, expected to spend one hour on a self-designed project that aligns with Google's values. How many of you use Gmail? Gmail came out of somebody's 20% time. How many of you use the click ads on Google search? Same thing. That came out of somebody's own project in the 20% time. University of California two years ago, three years ago now, found that if you're sitting at your, try this, you're sitting at your desk, you're doing a highly complex task, solving a problem, 
You go away for 30 minutes and spend 30 minutes on imagination. It could be reading a novel, listening to music, listening to the birdies. It doesn't matter, as long as your imagination is involved. When you come back after 30 minutes, you will, on average, have a 40% boost to your productivity in the next session. We need to allow people some reflection space. I don't mean we encourage people just to sit there and daydream, but daydreaming produces responses in the same area of the brain as complex problem solving. What do daydreamers do? They, in, they imagine future scenarios and them solving a problem in that scenario. That's why Einstein, that's why Newton, that's why Archimedes were all self-confessed daydreamers in old age. Sometimes you've got to be a bit counterproductive to be productive. If you want millennials to work better, by the way, put them in the same area of the office. Now, that sounds like a recipe for distraction, but that's the way they work. They work co cooperatively and collaboratively, and they feed on feedback. Not finished. Risk cultures for Generation Edge, very important. Did you know Israel has more startups per capita than any other nation on earth today? Do you know why it is? Because the corporate culture in Israel reflects the army culture in Israel. Every young person has to go through the army unless you're given a release because you're an Orthodox Jew. Most young people go through, and when they're in there, they get a nickname. Bibi, ben Benjamin Netanyahu, Prime Minister today, still called Bibi, that's his army nickname. Everybody is dwelling in the army in a flat culture. There are generals, there are colonels, there are sergeants, there are privates, just like the Aussie army. And there is respect for those ranks. But in the field, a private can challenge a general if the private thinks he or she has a better approach to solving the problem. Why? Because the nation is under constant existential threat. So everybody is expected to share equal responsibility. Carry that into business. Now, we have to be big enough to handle that if we're the leader. To realise that dissent is not the same as disloyalty. Someone can disagree with me and still have the best interests of the company at heart. And I shouldn't be threatened by that. I should be thankful. As long as they do it with respect, I should be thankful for it. But that's why Israel has more startups per head of population. Most of the chips you use on your computers and tablets now were first devised at Intel in Israel, not America. I remember... In 1969, some of you who walked with dinosaurs like me will remember sitting watching on one little black and white monitor at the front because we didn't have LCDs then. When man first put a big moon pr a boot print in the surface of the moon and we knew something important was happening, even though we were very young, what most of us don't realise or know is that three weeks before Apollo 11 left planet Earth, the lunar landing module crashed and burned in a test flight, almost killing a certain Neil Armstrong. Now, I'm glad there were no British health and safety people there at the time. I know you don't have those people here. They do a great job, don't get me wrong. But NASA had a culture at that time which said this, we know we're going to fail. 10 years to put a man on the moon. We know we're going to fail somewhere. Let's fail fast, fix it fast, and move on fast. I think that's a great culture. And it's very attractive to millennials and Generation Edge. Fail fast, fix it fast. Come on, move on fast. So what's the takeaway from this morning? <coughs> Technology is not destiny. The future isn't a product of our tech, but how we choose to use it. With different generational trades, millennials and gen edges shape corporate and civic life in very different ways, bringing to the table unique generational aspirations, characteristics and trades. We can get ahead of that change curve now, if we're willing, by fostering cultures to engage with those very <coughs> traits, collaborative cultures, somewhere within the organisation, an altruistic culture. Why do young people... We all do now, but it started with the young. Why do we love to buy fair trade coffee? Because we don't want to be consumers anymore. We want to be activists even when we're consuming. And that is more true of my children than it is of me. Trust cultures, pursuing ethics, 
we ever stop and think, what's the ethical approach to what we're about to do? To put it in Sandel's words, what's the right thing to do? Autonomy. Humanising the digital. And risk. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Gary. Well, I'm just thrilled that we've had this opportunity this morning, but before we break, uh, we wanted to just open up the floor for a few moments for...